You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Kipping is the Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Columbia University, where he researches extrasolar planets and moons. Dr. Kipping also leads the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, which includes a YouTube channel and a website where you can learn about their research. Dr. Kipping's other areas of research interests also include study and characterization of transiting exoplanets, exoplanet atmospheres, Bayesian inference, population statistics and understanding stellar hosts. He is also the principal investigator of the hunt for the exomoons with Kepler HEK project. We are well into the new year, and with how overwhelming things have been lately, it's important to have something that can help keep things in order for you. Building new habits is hard. Whether it's remembering to drink more water or just daily reminders that help with your professional life, Keeping track of my schedule is extremely important for making new episodes of Event Horizon. A good routine makes that possible. That's what makes today's sponsor, Fabulous, so great. It is the number one self-care app to help you build better habits and achieve your goals. Its premium membership unlocks every feature, including unlimited number of habits in your routines, daily coaching sessions, all journeys, all exercises, and you can restore and back up your journey progress. With Fabulous, you can 100% personalize your experience using either a self-coach or a more guided approach to habit building and tracking. With self-coach, you can pick among 100 recommended habits or create your own. If you need guidance on where and how to start, Fabulous will help you use programs to reach your objectives by developing your motivation and discovering best practices for wellness. Fabulous's interactive systems guide you to finding that ideal daily routine, one that actually sticks with you. I was also excited to learn how Fabulous uses scientifically proven methods that rely on decades of scientific research for using healthy habits by achieving small tasks every single day. That's why you should check out Fabulous and its premium membership, which includes daily coaching sessions and all exercises. Start building your ideal daily routine now. The first 100 people who click on the link below will get 25% off of a fabulous subscription. And I'm joined today by David Kipping of Columbia University. Now, David, you also recently released a video on the idea that green stars can't exist. Physics prohibits it. And not just in this universe, but if there's a multiverse, probably not. What is the major constraining factors that prevent a green star? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting problem. It's, it's something that I'd become familiar with, I think, even as an undergraduate. I think it was something that we did sort of toy calculations of. I did my undergraduate at Cambridge. And it really comes from the way that light is emitted from a star is through this kind of black body radiation, which is known as a Planck function. And it's one of the kind of undergraduate calculations that we often give even today here at Columbia as well to many of our students. And you can kind of work through, it's actually, you know, sort of first done by work by sort of Maxwell and Planck and, and these kind of giants of physics. And it's kind of remarkably simple that you can basically predict the entire stellar spectrum to first order. It's not a perfect approximation, but to a very good approximation, you can calculate how light should appear how much light at each single color, every possible wavelength that you could possibly observe as produced by a star in terms of just basically fundamental constants and one free parameter, which is the temperature of the star itself. So if you know the temperature of the surface, the outer layer, which is of course the only layer which you can see, the photosphere, then you can easily calculate the entire spectrum. In reality, there are you know, additional absorption features on top of that, especially as you go to very cool stars like M dwarfs, they tend to have almost kind of planetary atmospheres around them, which have much more complicated physics going on. But especially for hot stars, 
they really do very closely resemble the blank, the Planck function, the black body function. And so when you look at that simple equation and you try and tune it to create something that would look green, um, we, co- we of course know that there are red stars. You can you know think about a red dwarf or an M dwarf is kind of obviously named that way or a red giant. And essentially that just means the surface is cool. So if the surface is sort of 3,000, 4,000 Kelvin, it would have kind of a reddish orange color. And then as you kind of make it hotter and hotter, you'd eventually get to something that was a blue star, something like an F dwarf or an A-type star would have kind of a bluish hue to it. So you'd say it's blue hot. You can kind of think of sticking iron in the fire until it got really, really hot and eventually turned blue hot. But if you kind of cool it back down to sort of an intermediate zone, which is ultimately you know, close to our sun, you know, the sun is not green and it's actually kind of a whitish color. Of course, to us, it appears yellow from the Earth because of mostly because of scattering through the Earth's atmosphere. But we have this kind of whitish star. We call it a yellow dwarf, again, because of the Earth's atmospheric effect. But there's no such thing as a green dwarf. And it's really because when you get to, to kind of say in a very simple summary, when you get to something that's in between these red and blue stars in terms of its temperature, they're producing just as much blue light as they are red light. And so they equal each other out and you end up with something that appears largely white. Now, the only way you could create something to be green would be if you could take this function, which peaks at green light for the sun, pretty much actually peaks at green light, but produces so much red and so much blue, it looks white overall. If you could somehow compress that, make it narrower, more peaky, kind of peak it right up at green and sort of suppress the blue and suppress the red. If you could do that, then you could make the star look green. But the Planck function has no degrees of freedom to do that. There's nothing in the equation you can change to accomplish that. And it turns out even if you go into those fundamental constants, such as the speed of light and pi, and you try and change those, you still can't do it. There's no way that you could possibly create a green star. So it's kind of an interesting physics puzzle that some of us encountered an undergraduate, but I thought had some interesting implications as an example of thinking about techno signatures. Okay, now <laughs> we'll go into an interesting territory. All right. The sun does produce green light. It, you just can't see it because it looks white. But the plants on Earth absolutely hate that green light, which is why they reflect it and they are green. So would a green star, if it could hypothetically be possible, be a life killer? In other words, no life around a star like this. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. I think it, it would obviously depend on the type of the type of planet you have, the atmosphere, and the ability of life to adapt and to evolve to different conditions. Because of course, all life just adapts to the conditions it's, it's in. Now, certainly, if you imagine... Studies have been done, I know, that have tried to change the color of the star and see how that would affect plant life. Um, But again, they have been limited, not surprisingly, to stars which we know exist. So not these hypothetical green stars that we're imagining, which, as far as we can tell, can't exist. So you can, and basically there's two different uh, scenarios there. You You can imagine like a red dwarf star. In that case, there's hardly any high energy radiation being produced by it. Most of the light is actually peaking towards the infrared, which is, you know, it's a it's a longer wavelength of light. There's less energy contained within each photon. And so that's really the problem that the energy is quantized. And so through the photoelectric effect, the plants just struggle to photosynthesize. And so it's thought that in order to counter that, life might evolve to use a much broader range of colors. And so plants might actually appear kind of almost black in color as they try to get all of the radiation they can to get by on photosynthesis. And you look at the other end of the spectrum, you consider something that's blue hot. Well, there, the problem is that the star is probably producing so much high energy radiation is the opposite problem that it would probably be, be quite damaging. Certainly ultraviolet radiation is very damaging to life. It kind of damages DNA and causes it to mutate and break apart. So in that case, you'd imagine the plants may want to get rid of some of that high energy radiation. And so they'd most likely take on a blue color. So they'd reflect away the blue side of the spectrum. 
So it's thought that, you know, it, it's kind of very speculative because uh, we don't have any examples of this, but just logically working through the behavior of photosynthesis and how it would adapt to other, other stars, you would expect it to form blue uh, plants on, on the surface, blue vegetation, which would be quite a spectacle, I think, to imagine seeing. Now, when it comes to a green star, where you kind of, yeah, in a way, the sun is a green star, but it isn't. I mean, it peaks at green light. So if you want to know what life would look like under those conditions, you can just walk outside and see for yourself. But if you want to know what would life look like with a true green star, a star that was somehow artificially compressed, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I think uh, it'd be interesting to imagine how life would adapt. It certainly couldn't just reflect away all the green light because if it reflects away all of the green light and was green, then it would have no light to use for photosynthesis at all, because all of the light is now pretty much in the green channel. And yet, the in, if, if you were packing all of the intensity of flux into just one channel of light, that would be also pretty overwhelming for the plants, right? You can imagine it, it essentially burning the plants, and especially on a hot planet, if they were, if they were absorbing 100% of the light coming off the star. So, yeah, I'm not sure uh, what, what these plants would look like around these types of stars or if they could even exist. But there certainly have been efforts to think about other more realistic stars. And it's an interesting thought problem in astrobiology. Sore thumbs. Now, the idea of a green star being something that nature is just not going to produce, but it would be fairly easy if, if, if an alien civilization was so inclined to say, hey, we're here you could make a star green artificially. Now, what it, it seems to me that that's about the most easy techno signature you could search for since we have all of these stellar catalogs and characterizations and everything. Has anyone looked or are there any candidates? I don't believe anyone's looked for a green star specifically, no, but the, you know, I, I would kind of frame this a bit more broadly. So the video I made, and obviously the topic we're talking about today is very much focused on specifically a star which appears unphysical because it produces too much green light. But you could also imagine a star which is unphysical because it produces too much blue light or too much green, you know, uh, red light or too much infrared light. You can sort of choose whatever wavelength you want and imagine some version of that that is impossible for even a collection of stars, you know, kind of mashed together to kind of create that kind of spectrum. And so more broadly, we might think instead of saying the star has an unphysical color, the star has an unphysical spectrum. And in a way, we've kind of done that. So the search for Dyson spheres, the search for alien megastructures sort of does that. And the idea is to look for stars which are unphysically too bright in the infrared. So these alien megastructures, such as a Dyson sphere, they collect all of the light from the star and they reprocess it. They use it for computation or for just habitation on, on this around this shell or whatever they're using it for. And then they produce infrared radiation as a result. That's the waste heat. And there's really no way around that. That's just sort of a, a byproduct of thermodynamics. Now, if, if you have a structure which is not complete, especially, then you can imagine it producing some fraction of its flux in infrared and some fraction of its flux which is leaking through just as visible light, more of a typical stellar spectrum. And so you have this kind of mishmash of two spectra on top of each other. And that would immediately appear pretty strange to an astronomer. And you could then say, well, this appears unphysical. I can't think of a mechanism by which naturally this would occur. And so this could be an example of a possible tetanus signature. Um, and people, as you know, have done that. So, you know, Jason Wright, for instance, has scoured through the spectra and colors of something like 100,000 nearby stars and 100,000 nearby galaxies even, and just looked at those colors to see if anything about them makes them appear excessively infrared bright. And actually there are candidates, especially in the galaxies. I remember there was a few objects there that really did stand out. However, the problem is that that signature is not unambiguous. And another way which you can produce this infrared artificial color is through a completely natural process, and that's just dust. If you have lots of dust around the star, which is kind of speculated, of course, for Boyajian star, Tabby star, then that will also produce an infrared excess that could explain uh, this kind of strange spectra you're seeing. So certainly there has been searches for un unnatural spectra, you might say, 
um, that have been hypothesized specifically as a result of this mechanism of a Dyson sphere or some kind of megastructure, someone doing work on the flux. But I guess in the video, I was, and, uh, and since making that video, I've been sort of advocating that we should think more broadly about this idea. It's not just an infrared excess. Of course, there we have an obvious mechanism by which we can imagine the civilizations might produce it. But, you know, that's just our imagination. There's also, we can imagine all sorts of ways the spectrum could be distorted, but not truly understand the mechanism by which they're doing it. One example, therefore, would be a green star, but it's just an example of this whole breadth of ideas that we could conceive of as a way of looking for tetanus signatures. Now, in regards to KSC 462852, the Artavi star, or Boyajin star, or the WTF star, and it's many other names, what's interesting there is no infrared detected so far. Now, I don't know what observations were done to look for that, but I it seemed to be enough to say, well, this whatever this material is, it's probably cold. Do you agree that that star is particularly weird because of no infrared? Oh yeah, for sure. That I mean, it's it's a strange star. Coupled, I mean, when you when you couple the fact it has these these dust dimmings. So the reason why you need know, to explain why I mentioned dust there as an explanation is because these things which cause these dips in light uh, that we've obviously have recorded as, as something is passing in front of the star, um, making it decrease in brightness. And we've been able to tell through the work of Tabriagin, who's been following it up over the last few years, that, m that many of these dips appear chromatic, which is to say, when you look in blue light and red light, they have different depths. And so if it was a solid shell of material, you know, a physical, completely opaque structure, then blue light shouldn't get through any more than red light. So that already tells you that whatever is blocking out the light is not something that's opaque. It is something which has some kind of semi-transparency to it or is scattering light in a way that's consistent, for example, with dust. Dust certainly does that. You look at, uh, or even just any small particulates, if you look up, of course, at the at the sky and you see a blue sky, where well, the reason why it's blue is because of scattering and the particles through valley scattering prefer to scatter blue light more heavily than red light. And you see a similar kind of effect with all kinds of particulate dust and scattering mechanisms. And similarly here for Bayer and Star, that's thought to be what's going on. That's not completely satisfying though, because then how do you make sense of the, <laughs> of the lack of infrared? Well, I think, yeah, you, you kind of touched on it. The the way out would be to imagine that, yes, there is there is dust which is blocking out this light, but it's sufficiently far away from the star that it's very cool, and thus it is producing infrared flux. It's just that infrared flux is so diminutive, so small, that our telescopes have not yet been able to detect it. The dust itself could be very patchy, and it might not be an entire sphere of dust covering the star. It might just be small clouds, which are occasionally pass in front, in which case the cross section of that dust is much smaller. And so it maybe makes sense why you haven't seen a bright infrared excess. But hey, it would be great to, you know, use our f new infrared capabilities that telescopes like James Webb are offering us now to maybe try and resolve what's going on with Biagin Star and analogs to it, because I'm sure there are already there's hints actually of, of other objects which, you know, could be doing similar types of behavior. Yes, in fact, I conducted a recent interview and uh, <laughs> with an astronomer that seems to have found others, you know, um, actually across two papers, and there seems to be analogs of Voyage and Star. The weird thing is, is they seem to cluster in space and they shouldn't. Now, thinking in terms of astrobiology, I mean, can we lay Tabby Star down as a techno signature possibility. Can we finally say that this is just some kind of astrophysical dust situation that we've never seen before? And once we understand it, then we'll know and we'll see these, you know, a population of these in the universe. Or is it still on the table in your mind? I, I'd say the problem with it's still on the table is the short answer. And but the the longer answer is that that's basically true of almost everything. And that's kind of the problem with techno signatures more broadly. So almost any observation could be a techno signature. The the problem is that we really want unambiguous techno signatures. And so that's that's 
probably comes back to this argument about green stars, which I think would satisfy that criterion to some degree. Um, as far as we know, there is no way in nature to make a, a stellar spectrum peak in the green with a, such a sufficiently narrow width that at least, you know, to uh, to humanize it would appear green or even just to such a degree that it would not be able to be matched by uh, stellar models, a Planck function, essentially. So if you can imagine some some kind of technical like that, that'd be almost impossible to explain because you're uh, in it with I guess the basic problem with these te with these infrared technical signatures is that they're two component. You have one component which is just a normal star, and then you have a second component which is something which is just warm material. And that those two components in of themselves do not constitute an unambiguous techno signature. If that's if that's what you've got, obviously there's more going on with Bergen star. But if that's all you had, just strange colours in infrared and optical light, that wouldn't be enough because we can imagine how it's quite possible to have something warm around a star. It's not that difficult to imagine ways of doing that. And so you certainly can't rule out that what's going on with Bergen star is a techno signature. But that's kind of the problem. I mean, I can show you a light curve. This is also true of light curves. I can show you a light curve that has a strange shape. It dips in, in, in strange ways. And I would be able to explain it very well with an alien megastructure. And that's true of any light curve you could pretty much show me. As long as it's like it's a decrease in flux, you could always imagine some intricate structure of material organized in just the right way to create the pattern that you see in your light curve. And that's even true of a circular planet. So if I see a planet pass in front of a star, even though it's a it's a sphere, it creates a certain dip in light, which is kind of a semi-trapezoidal type shape. And it's also true that you can fit every single planetary light curve perfectly with an alien alien megastructure model. Not even necessarily a, a sphere either. There's actually an infinite number of possible configurations, it turns out, that can all match the light curve. We did a paper about that called Shadow Imaging a few years ago in my team. So that's kind of the problem, that if you say, well, the data is consistent with a techno signature, that's great, but that's not enough. You also have to get to another level, which is that there's no other natural explanation that could possibly explain it. And so that's why, you know, in traditional radio SETI, you know, you might say looking for like a prime number sequence or something is so appealing because as far as we know, there are no narrow band, high powered radio transmitters that produce prime number sequences. Maybe someone will one day prove that there are, but as far as we know right now, that just doesn't happen naturally in the universe. And so if you see something like that, it's uh, right now that would be classified as an unambiguous technical signature. But with the problem with Bayajin star, I think, and generally these infrared excesses, is that they are inherently ambiguous. Um, and so it's it's unclear whether we'll ever get to the point of a clear alien detection following at least that path exclusively. Aliens are hard to spot, and that's that ambiguity. And when we do sometimes see something that, at least on its face, appears unambiguous, such as the wow signal, then you have to confirm it and you can't. So you have layers of ambiguity, you know, because you can't really eliminate if it wasn't some type of weird interference that nobody's thought of a way for it to have happened, but it, we're still the most likely explanation for it because we emit radio as a civilization. Mm -hmm. So the, I think people often think, well, you should see unambiguous evidence of aliens. And even Enrico Fermi made that mistake. But the fact is, is that aliens are very, very hard to spot because of the ambiguity. And we ourselves, our best signature of us being here is the biosignature of Earth's atmosphere. Again, going back to the disequilibrium you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But as a civilization, we'd be really hard to spot. And it could simply be that the solution to the Fermi paradox is that aliens are hard to detect. What do you think about that? Do you think that that has more legs than a rare earth hypothesis? Sure. I mean, I'm, as you know, I try to remain very agnostic about the existence and reality of life and intelligence in the universe. I'm, I, I will make up my mind when I see data that establishes it either way. 
And so the the problem we have, certainly when it comes to intelligent life and to some degree even for biosignatures, is what do you do with a series of null results? And this is something I'm thinking a lot about in my in my team at the moment and have just sort of started making some some progress on from a statistical perspective, actually sort of formulating this. The problem with a series of null results is that it can't ever disprove the, it can't ever we well, can't ever prove that we're alone, right? I can't say to you, look, I looked at 10 planets and I didn't detect any biosignatures. I didn't detect any oxygen in their atmosphere. And therefore, I'm going to conclude that none of those 10 planets have life. And you would rightly say to me, hold on, David, um, you know, for most of Earth's ish- history, there was no oxygen on the Earth. This is a relatively recent phenomena being produced since the great ox- oxidation event that occurred on the Earth. And so if you looked at the Earth at any one random point in time before complex multicellular life and photosynthesis got going, you wouldn't have this huge biosignature to look for in the first place. And so you'd have an inhabited planet that looks completely consistent with your observations. And so perhaps all 10 of those planets are inhabited, but just with very simple microbial life, and it can get even more extreme, right? You can imagine something living underneath the surface in caves or underneath the oceans, in which case the signature could be greatly attenuated if, if there's any signature at all. And so the, I guess the challenge we have, it's, it's unique. In most experiments, when you design your experiment, you can have a clear positive and a clear null result. If you go do a COVID test and you get a null result, it has a clear interpretation versus a positive result. But a null result in this experiment is not the same. It doesn't actually disprove or necessarily even put much pressure on, depending on your assumptions, the idea of life in the universe. And that's equally true, perhaps even more true for tetanus signatures. Just because I don't detect a radio transmitter on Alpha Centauri does not mean there's nobody living there. right? I mean, it, it's probably unlikely someone's living there, but... It, it's you certainly can't use that as your sole basis to say that therefore Alpha Centauri is a life an intelligent devoid system, and so this is uh, this is a real problem from an experimental design perspective and something I'm certainly grappling with at the moment. Now, in regards to an intentional techno signature, in other words, turning a star green, is it easier? And this gets into the the cheap ways to message other civilizations. Is this a cheaper way potentially to do this than, say, Arnold Louvers? Mm, it, yeah, they, they do have similarities. And I think it depends on your implementation of uh, the Green Star. So, you know, Luke Arnold's paper on in terms of you know triangles or louvres, first off, that's published research that has been peer reviewed, which is of course you know the gold standard of of scientific credence for a published study. And just to give full disclosure, the video I made about green stars is really just that. It's kind of a classic undergraduate calculation, so that's not particularly controversial. But the idea of using it as a technical signature is not published research, and certainly. If I was going to publish it, I would want to make those kinds of comparisons. I'd want to compare, you know, the feasibility compared to these other ideas, the detectability, et cetera. And so uh, there is certainly a lot more, I think, to be explored with the idea of not just a green star, but as I said, the broader idea of artificial spectra and un- un- physical spectra that luminous objects in the universe may be producing. Having said all that, uh, as my caveat, as my boilerplate warning, I think they're they're both have uh, pros and cons. I think the the attraction of the Arnold structure is that it's it's very long lived and it's passive. So all you really need to do is put this sheet of metal or whatever it is, a sheet of material in orbit of your star. And because it doesn't have any active machinery, any active parts or electronics, it should stay there for a very long time. It, the actual longevity has not been calculated, but I think we're probably looking at billions of years for something like that. For these green stars, how do you make a star green? Now, again, the, the mechanisms of that have not been deeply explored. And I kind of playfully suggested in the video, one way would be just, of course, to put a, trans, a semi-transparent sheet of material, a green filter in front of your star. So kind of like a giant bubble, or it could even be a transient phenomena. You can imagine the star temporarily turning green as some kind of 
green sheet of material passes in front of the star. But I think there's probably cleverer ways of doing it. I really enjoyed the interactions I had with many of my YouTube followers who were who were sparking really interesting discussions about the idea of perhaps um, peppering the surface of the star with interesting elements such as manganese or copper and things like this that could perhaps create the the green light through a kind of doping mechanism of the stellar surface. The problem with that, of course, is that stars are convective and so they kind of swirl material around. So even if you doped the surface, it's not going to stay there, at least for a star like our own sun. But there are some stars where, like, um, that you might be able to, not like a sun-like star, but other stars where you might be able to imagine keeping that material at the surface for a prolonged period of time. So I think there's a, some more research and ideas that needs to be fleshed out in terms of a direct comparison of the two. But both are attractive as completely passive, no machinery, no electronics, and in principle, extremely long-lived. And neither of them really present much information. So that's kind of the downside. I mean, you don't learn. I can't transmit my encyclopedia to you through making my star look green. Nor can I really transmit much information by a few louvers. You could maybe get like a couple of prime numbers in there or something, but you certainly can't transmit a huge amount of information. And so both of them have that limitation as compared to, say, traditional radio transmission, where you could potentially pack a lot of information in. Is there a technological reason to make a star green <laughs> that to, would make it more useful to an alien civilization? In other words, it wouldn't be for signaling, but it would be something useful for the civilization? And I have a related question after this. In terms of gr green specifically, not, not that I'm aware of. I certainly think you can imagine distorting the spectrum in certain ways that would be advantageous to your planet. So one example might be the ultraviolet, for instance. So... Ultraviolet radiation is, of course, pretty damaging to most surface life on the Earth, and we are protected from it because we have an ozone layer. So if you took the ozone layer away, uh, the rate of mutations and DNA damage would rapidly increase. And, you know, you can imagine that being pretty, maybe not a showstopper for life necessarily, but certainly it would maybe make agriculture far more challenging if most of your crops are being burnt to a crisp from intense uv flux so you could imagine in such a case maybe you know choosing uv light as a particularly damaging wavelength that you want to remove and so you could build a screen and it wouldn't need to be a screen which covers the entire star it would only need to be you could maybe park it in so one of the lagrange points sat between your planet and the star like a like a semi-transparent shield that just gets rid of that very high energy radiation for you in fact that would actually be fairly easy to do probably something just like dust actually because as we said dust really likes to block out really likes to scatter the short wavelength radiation much more than long wavelength radiation so just actually throwing a load of dust into a lagrange point might be enough to kind of create that type of effect and protect the planet had they had disastrously remove their ozone layer through some kind of industrial activity. Now, a super civilization, let's, let's assume that there's no limits to how powerful a civilization can get. You know, let's go full on type three Kardashev scale here. Green galaxies. Now, could you scale this up? And it's been suggested with an astrobiology, the idea of the red spiral, where you have a alien civilization in another galaxy nearby that you could detect that's kicking out dangerous stars. And as a result, the galaxy will unnaturally redden. Could you unnaturally create a situation where a galaxy appears green? And could you do it even more efficiently than turning every star green, but rather put a foreground object or something like that to sort of manipulate the spectra from the entire galaxy into a uh, unnaturally green color. Yeah, that's that's certainly an interesting idea. It would, of course, be something on an enormous scale to imagine that being done. But in a sense, we should be okay with that because, after all, we're comfortable looking for entire galaxies which have been essentially transformed into Dyson spheres. That's something that there have been observational efforts to constrain and study that we've already talked about. And so, sure, if you if you imagine a civilization capable of doing that kind of thing, why not also imagine them doing something like this on an entire galactic scale? I think you sort of have to question 
I mean, this, it's always a dangerous game, Xeno psychology, but what is the motivation for this? I think for a single star, if we imagine green specifically as, as the example within the, and again, I'm trying to paint this within a broader picture of all types of artificial spectra we could create, but just taking an example of green specifically, I'm not sure of any clear, obvious benefit to making your star green from a, you know, from a, utilization perspective except for the fact you're signaling you're basically saying this is clearly weird <laughs> no, no star shouldn't do this so you might want to look in our neighborhood or it could even be i, I suggest in the video it could be like a cosmic art piece you know there's there's no u utility to it but civilization goes around doing this for their own perspective of making the universe appear more aesthetic uh, you know, that this is the motivation for it, or it may simply be something more like the pyramids, like a monument. You know, they, they suspect that they will not last forever, uh, quite reasonably, and so decide to leave some permanent record of their existence for the for future generations in the galaxy to later discover. Now, if you're gonna, so I can kind of understand a motivation for doing that on a individual basis, and maybe it's my own limitations, but it's it's harder for me to imagine the motivation for doing that on an entire galactic scale. It's a pretty phenomenal exercise to go through converting an entire galaxy purely for the purposes of either art or signaling. But you know, if a, when we talk about K3 civilizations, I guess everything's in play. And certainly the mechanism you suggested is not unreasonable. You could, of course, do it probably on an individual stellar basis. But if you were targeting a specific galaxy, then you could potentially travel in between those two galaxies along the line of sight and just put some much smaller sheet of material between them rather than necessarily having to cloud your entire galaxy with some giant bubble. But that's definitely getting pretty speculative. I like it, but it's uh, maybe harder for me to imagine the the motivations behind why they would necessarily do that yeah but that gets into the sticky area of of trying to understand the mind of an alien <laughs> which <laughs> right right which i'm always cautious about yeah yes one must be very cautious about that now everybody should check out this video the star that can't exist over on the cool world's youtube channel and David, my final question for you about this is something that really piqued my interest because apparently the physics are such that you can't suspect that these would even exist in the multiverse. Why is that? Yeah, so it depends exactly what you mean by uh, the range of multiverses we consider what's allowed. But uh, in the video, I, was, I tried to be careful with my language when I described that, but I meant a, a, a multiverse of universes where the only difference is that the physical constants are varied. So the constants especially that go into the Planck equations, so that would be the Planck constant, H, the speed of light, C, and the Boltzmann constant, K. So if you varied those three constants, no matter how you did it, you can make them any value you want, you can never create a stellar spectrum that peaks in a compressed way that to human eyes, it would appear green. So there's just no way of doing that. So that's what I meant by a multiverse. But you could also, you know, you could distort that more broadly and say that's too limited. Maybe there are multiverses where the, you know, the Planck function itself simply doesn't operate at all, in which case all bets are off. So I was, I was trying to be fairly careful in my language that it's a multiverse where just the physical constants are changing. Um, and certainly there's actually good theoretical grounds to imagine such a construct, in fact. And, and this actually even has, you know, people were in the video had some great feedback and were suggesting, hey, maybe there's a way you can make it green by making the star move uh, close to the speed of light. So you can have a blue star and it's racing uh, away from us. So it's being red shifted. And if it's racing away from us, that blue spectrum would be shifted towards the green. And maybe that would pull off the desired effect. Which is a really interesting idea. Now, we didn't talk about it in the video, but I worked it through afterwards, and it turns out that that doesn't help you. And you actually just end up with, again, a basically sun-like spectrum. It, again, just has a, almost equal amounts of blue and red light that lead to a whitish color. So there's really no way around it. It's really weird that the universe, no matter if you go through special, special relativity, no matter if you go through a multiverse of constants, no matter what you do, it's actually really strangely interesting that there's no way, apparently, to make a star appear green to human eyes. 
And so that that's kind of where this idea ultimately stems from. You know, it seems like the universe is providing us a shortcut then as a way of saying, hey, we're here because if anyone else understands radiation physics, then they would clearly know something was very amiss by seeing a green star. The best source for food for thought is a YouTube comments section when you run a science channel. I am always reading my comments yeah. and it's absolutely <laughs> astonishing what people come up with and I absolutely love it. David, we are out of time and I will uh, talk to you again next time you release a new paper and amazing stuff lately, especially on, on the Cool Worlds channel. I've really enjoyed watching the videos lately. Thank you so much, John. And uh, yeah, I love Event Horizon. Always happy to be on here and you guys make awesome content. Thank you for having me here. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.